It was the Christmas of 1989, and I received what I believe was one of the greatest inventions of the 20th century, the Nintendo Entertainment System. It came into my house. All you kids with your Xbox 360 and whatnot, nothing beat Mario and Duck Hunt. I'm telling you, you remember that combo game? That was the greatest game. Duck Hunt was the greatest game, I believe. Now, this Atari 2600 business. It was Nintendo Entertainment System. But we were a homeschool family. How many homeschool families out there? You know what it's like. Homeschool through elementary school. You had to have limits and restrictions. So again, all my friends could play as long as they want when they were done at school. I had these limits and restrictions. Again, it was appropriate. Now, being a parent, I understood what moderation is now. But as a child, I mean, you want to play this for countless hours of the day. So the rule was I had to finish all my math homework in the morning to be able to, like, earn time in the afternoon. Well, this was the system. Well, shortly after that, my mom was in a serious car accident. So she had severe whiplash. My dad took some time off work. Well, as she's recovering, uh, she really was immobile for most of that season. So one morning, back when my dad goes back to work, I, I pull out my math page. And normally the thing you would do is I'd do my math page, bring it to my mom. She would check the, the answers, and I would correct anything that was wrong and then be able to finish uh, in the early afternoon. Well, this day comes. I fill up my math page, hand it to my mom, and she's in so much pain. She says, great job, Brandon, and hands me the page back. And I get this idea. I said, I don't think my mom's going to check my work because she doesn't feel well. So instead of going to play outside, I ran back to my room and filled out another math page with bogus answers. So I'm like, Mom, I decided to do more math. And I bring her the page. She's like, Brandon, I'm so proud of you. You've earned double time today. And I, I realized I entered into a new age. The next day, three math pages, four math pages. I'm getting accolades at the dinner table. I'm excelling in my math work. She's reporting to my dad. I'm getting all these privileges. I was living like a prince in my house. Well, the day came when I bring the math page to mom. I finished my math book earlier than I ever have. She says, Brandon, I'm so proud of you. Let's review all of your work that you've done. I turn ghost white. I hand her my book, and I just go to my room expecting like this voice of thunder. You know the mom voice. And nothing, I didn't hear anything. I listen, I start to hear crying. And I walk, I'm like, Mom, what's wrong? She's like, Brandon, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry I haven't helped you. I, I'm sorry you haven't understood how to answer these questions. So here's my mom having a crisis. She thinks I have a learning disability. <laughs> Because I've, I've written all these insane answers. I'm using alphabet letters. I mean, it was the worst math you could think of. And then I thought, maybe. No, I did not. I'm like, Mom, I'm so sorry. And then I burst into tears. And then the mom was, you did what? And you know, it comes out. I'm erasing. I have to rewrite all these pages. There's rubber eraser and tears in my, on my desk. And See, when you're a little child, we, we have these fantasies and we think that we can get away and cut corners when no one's watching. That if you're not held accountable, maybe you don't have to complete the whole test. But what's so unique is that they found that although we think we mature out of cheating, we mature out of getting and cutting corners, we actually get worse as adults because we get better at it. So one sociologist, amazing guys, great documentary called Dishonest. I don't know if you can find it on Netflix anymore. But this man named Dan Ariely, I mean, incredible story. He was a burn victim. I mean, just incredible story. But he studied ethics in society. So they put on this massive experiment. 40,000 people were tested in this experiment. So what they would do is they'd bring people into a test room and they'd say, here's a, here's a sheet with math problems. And we want you to solve as many problems as you can in the allotted time. And for every problem you solve, you get $1. But this is a test of trust. So when you complete the test, you're going to walk it over to the shredder and shred it. And then you tell us how many answers you've completed. And for every answer, you get $1. So they set the time for five minutes. People would fill it out, turn it in the shredder. And the average person 
reported that they solved six problems. They would receive six dollars. A few people said that they answered all 20. Well, they rigged the time and knew that they could only really solve about three problems to four problems in five minutes. What they didn't know is the shredder was reversed, so it didn't actually shred the paper. And they got all this data back. 70% of the people reported they solved six problems when they only answered four. And they've learned there was these out, there's a few outliers where they, people literally wrote down 20 fake answers and turned in out $20. But they've, they've learned that people are really good at cheating a little bit. We're really talented at shaving off just enough to help the data or help us think that we're actually improving what we're working on. This is what he said. People often tend to tweak data and convince themselves that they're simply helping the data show its true nature. Here's the thing. We're really good at putting on that fake Christian smile when we're in the middle of a wilderness or in the middle of a test. But let me let you into a little secret. God is not going to be fooled. God sees everything. He's watching you. And you can't get away from it. He's watching you in the wilderness. He's watching you in your season of testing. But he's not looking for the external results. He's after the internal transformation. Haunting verse, Jeremiah 17, verse 10. I, the Lord, test the mind and search the heart to give all according to their ways, according to the fruit of their doing. It's a brutal verse because he sees everything. Don't you just praise God that people can't read your mind? <laughs> Preach. So glad. But God sees it all. And what he does is he takes us into these seasons of wilderness to prune us, to test us, to mature us, to turn us into Christ. That's what Romans 8 says, that we're in this journey of transformation to look like Jesus. And that's a brutal and a hard process. How many ever took a pottery class in high school or junior high or college? See, I loved it. You think you're so good at it, too. And then once it goes, like, into the fire in the kiln, it looks terrible. You ever see that before? You ever put it in the kiln, and you're like, this is a masterpiece, and it blows up in the kiln? We finally got good enough that we could actually, like, use the wheel. And it's a living parable when you're on one of these wheels because you're there, and every slight movement throws it out of alignment because you feel like the clay is fighting against you as the potter. But eventually, you're able to work the clay so the clay works with you. See, Jesus will keep you in the wilderness as long as he wants until you start to agree to work with him. He'll keep shaving at you and, and moving you. And you create this beautiful thing. I remember the first day I was on the, the potter wheel. I had this awesome vase. Everybody thinks there's a vase. You go from ashtray to vase, you know. So I'm creating this vase, and I get up, and I wore, it was the era of white cargo khaki pants. And I wake up and I have clay all over me for the rest of the day. You know, this massive accident. You see, we have to understand the transformation process is messy. It's long. It's vulnerable. It's sensitive. But we have to be willing to work with Jesus in the process. Because we're after what we call lasting fruit, not temporal fruit. We're after fruit that will last. And good fruit takes time takes a lot of time. It's not an accident that the main agricultural, you know, example that the Bible uses is the vineyard. There's a reason why it's vineyards over and over again. It's the hardest thing to take care of. And did you know that the greatest fruit out of a vine comes in the middle of a dry season? The greatest years of wine that California has experienced was during our drought. And they plant these vineyards on hillsides where the dirt is dry and arid and there's rocky soil because the vine learns to struggle for water. 
And the greatest seasons of produce is when there's a drought because the vineyard struggles so hard, it literally thinks this is the last fruit I will produce in my life. And in the last season, it produces the greatest harvest. And then rain comes and it has another season. You may be in that time where you're like, this is it. I'm on the brink of giving up. The best fruit is yet to come. And God is testing the mind. He's testing the heart. He's saying, will you remain faithful? Because I'm faithful. And what the Spirit of God does in a beautiful way is he leads us to the wilderness. Now, we don't understand why God chooses this method, but he chooses this method. In Matthew 4, verse 1, he uses this this weird word for tempt that also means test. It's the Spirit of God leads Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Now, this word is a double meaning. Matthew knows exactly what he's doing. If you're a theology nerd, you're like, what about James chapter 1 where it says God tests no one or tempts no one? Here's the context. See, what Jesus does and what God does in our life is he leads us in the wilderness to test us, to discipline us. That's what that word is used there. It means to train us and refine us and to form us. But what the enemy does is God uses the wilderness for discipline. The enemy uses temptation for disqualification. So he's trying to disqualify you of your rightful inheritance. That's the whole goal of temptation in the enemy's life. We have to remember, God uses the wilderness for discipline, but the enemy uses temptation for disqualification. That's what he's after in the long run. And what we'll notice here is he goes right after the identity of Jesus. Because where your identity is where your inheritance is. And when you know your identity, you can receive your inheritance. You ever hear of like those people that discover they were part of a royal family and all of a sudden they have this rightful inheritance that they never knew that they had? That's the context of Christianity. The moment you say yes to Jesus, you become sons and daughters of God and you have access to kingdom inheritance. If he's able to convince you to step out of the will of your father's house, you won't be able to live in the inheritance that's rightfully yours. Let's picture the prodigal son. When he's out of the father's house, he's in the world. He runs out of resource. But when he comes back to his father's house, the resource is available and ready for him again. So here's the enemy. He comes in. He's called the tempter. Now, it was a really weird tradition, but the monastics literally believed that as part of their discipleship process, you would go to the literal wilderness to fight the devil. Praise God we're not in that discipleship school. They believed you would literally fight these demonic spirits in the desert. They took some verses way out of context. But again, this picture is really the journey we go on. The moment you say yes to Jesus and you have that euphoric altar call, we all remember that, and there's the warm fuzzies, guess what's next? The wilderness is next. And the wilderness is tough, but this is where true refinement begins. And one of the main goals of this series is to teach us that the Christian life is a glorious life, but there's suffering in that life. And that suffering won't cease till the other side of eternity. It just won't. And a lot of us give up on our faith, and we give up on Jesus because things get hard. But he never promised you happiness as the context of the world has shown us. See, he's not after your happiness. He's after your holiness. And he wants you to look like him and talk like him and be him amongst the rest of the world. So here we have this name. He calls him the tempter. And again, when you read the New Testament, you're going to have all these different phrases that refer to Satan. Here's what one scholar says. The figure of Satan as an individual spiritual enemy of God and his people is found only rarely in the Old Testament. We have a couple of verses here. By the first century, it had developed under a variety of names. Here's all the names he was called in the first century. Belial, Belier, Mestema, Azazel, and most commonly, Satan, into a standard feature of Jewish belief which the Christian church fully shared. So there was this belief and this understanding that there's this real enemy of God that is against his kingdom. Now, I just want to encourage you, if you're after, you know, after studying theology and scripture, don't get lost in the study of demonology. Guys, I'm going to speak straight. There's some bad theology on Satan and demons. YouTube is not a great educator. I'll speak straight. 
So you'll get lost, and that's what the enemy does. He loves for you to find all these things and try to, I remember when I, the first total book of the Bible I read when I was eight was the book of Revelation, and I was convinced I was going to figure out who the Antichrist was. I literally took the 666, and I'm breaking math equations down on everybody's name. Is it my neighbor? You know, like all that kind of stuff. We get lost in these rabbit holes that lead us away from the revelation of Jesus. See, even the book of Revelation, the beginning is the revelation of Jesus, and we've made it about some antichrist figure as the central theme. That's not the truth. It's not what we're after. We're after knowing Jesus, looking like Jesus, becoming like Jesus. That's the goal. And honestly, there's only like two or three verses in the Old Testament that even reference Satan. When you read these different people that try to break down Satan theology and understanding it, it's so out of context, you cannot believe it. A lot of those prophecies that we've been told about what Satan is and not, they're actually direct prophecies to kings that lived during the time of Ezekiel and Isaiah. And and we don't understand that because we're thousands of years removed. Your pursuit should be after Jesus, not the enemy. That's our goal. Don't be an expert in those things. Be an expert in his great things. Like, that's what we're after. So here we have all these names, but the main takeaway of what Matthew is saying is that Satan is the adversary and he's the accuser. That's the context. And what Matthew does brilliantly is this whole discourse between Satan and Jesus is actually setting the work and setting the frame for when Jesus confronts the Pharisees. The same way he confronts Satan is the same way he confronts the Pharisees. If you take all those illustrations of confrontation with the Pharisees, the climax is you're the son of the father of lies. What we have to understand is the main system Jesus points and associates with Satan is the religious system, not the world. His major playground is religion. It's dangerous. Think about this. How often do you hear Satan brought up outside of being cast out of someone? It's always in confrontation with the religious Pharisees. Because the moment you say yes to Jesus, you're encountered by the Spirit of God, you're now a threat to the kingdom of darkness. You know what isn't a threat to the kingdom of darkness? Religion. So if he can rule in that domain and silence the church, he'll win. And a lot of us, when we say yes to Jesus, we think all the warfare goes away. It gets greater. It's harder. Because you're in a real fight. No war is one without war. Honestly, you think it's going to be rosy with Jesus? It's amazing. Trust me, yes, but it's hard. We moved into our neighborhood, believing for revival. One of the darkest seasons of my life. We were having full-blown demonic encounters in our nightlife. Fights and anger. It's not until my daughter has this dream where randomly, and again, just listen to my message at 9 a.m. This is way off course. I won't get to the content. I'm just going to warn you because we're going to bring up Natalie Creary. But my, my daughter has this dream, and she wakes up crying from this dream. And we hear it, and we're like, what are you dreaming about? She's like, I have this dream about this dragon. And, and then Rachel says, I think there's more to this. Tell me the whole dream. And in the dream, my daughter is outside playing, and all of our our kids are outside, and we're there, and this giant dragon is flying around the house. And she's there, and she says, and mom, we obeyed you first time and went in the house as soon as you said, get in the house. (laughs) And she gets in the house, and then she says, and daddy, and then three guys I was discipling at the time all come out with swords in their hand. And we're standing in the street about to fight this dragon. Well, as we're there and it's circling around, it lands on our house and is crushing our home. And then Jesus shows up and rebukes the dragon and says, get away from this house. These are my people. And the dragon is killed, right? And she says, and then Jesus came down and we went inside and had cake and ice cream with Jesus. It's the best cake party. 
That is the best kick party. When we take the dream to heart, we call the guys that are in the dream. We're like, we just need to pray. Well, one of the guys, I mean, this guy is, is next level. Literally, he's, I think he has an evangelism tent right now on Auburn Boulevard as we're speaking. He's just unbelievable. Named Michael Ganchenko. Michael says, Pastor Brandon, we're called to pray. I was like, yep, I know we're called to pray. He's like, no, like real prayer. I'm like, Michael, like, I, I pray. Like, he's like, no, like a real prayer, Brandon. We're going to pray in your house. So I was like, absolutely. You name the time. He's like, I feel like we're supposed to pray in your house for seven days, 12 hours a day. I'm like, Michael, gosh. Like, <laughs> like I love that about you. But I also don't love that about you. You know what I mean? Like, you're like, gosh, man, like, you're preaching to me. I'm supposed to preach to you. And um, he's like, I want permission to pray in your house for seven days, and I will fast all those hours. I said, okay, great. I said, I'll join you when I can. <laughs> and we'd pray. And Vanessa and Brandon remember this. I remember one night, <laughs> we're having a discipleship meeting. And we're there, and I'm like, hey, guys, if you hear yelling, it's just Michael praying. Like, it's not bad. It's nothing wrong going on there. And this guy would pray to the same song Morgan remembers this over and over and over again. Repeat these songs. And so like there's some worship songs. I'm like, it takes me right back to that day. But I'm like, I cannot hear that song ever again. <laughs> we pray for seven days. This is dicey water. I'm going to have to be careful with this one. But in the middle of that prayer, we're praying for a house that was a drug house. Right across the street. The crazy amounts of drug trafficking going on. And Michael says, in Jesus' name, we declare that house as a house of prayer. I'm like, that's the craziest, most absurd prayer. <laughs> well, shortly afterwards, we end the prayer time. Cops come. Helicopters come. Drug house is vacated. We're like, praise God. Mormon family moves in. Praise God. So we start praying for this Mormon family. Out of nowhere, I see a notice on the door. I'm like, oh, no, what happened? If they had trouble paying their bills, they should have just told us. Like, that was the thing. The house got condemned because there was all this miselectrical use, right? Well, it goes into this massive renovation. The city shuts it down. And is Naomi here? The other girls are here. Our, a girl comes over and it's like, is that house for rent? I said, yeah, but it's, I'm going to be straight, straight with you. It's really overpriced. She's like, well, let me talk to the person. Talks the rent down. Four girls move in, and it's been a house of prayer for nearly a year. Every Monday, they've been praying. Crazy, crazy. See, we easily get intimidated by the enemy. Because I'm going to speak straight. He's stronger than we are, but we serve a God that's stronger and unless if we surrender to him and trust him in the journey, unless we trust him in the journey, we'll have what happened to Israel happen to us. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 5, brutal verse, says this. These were examples for us because God was not pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness. See, the enemy is seeking to tempt you, to disqualify you from what you already qualified for because Jesus paid the price. He paid it for you. But the beautiful thing is in the middle of your wilderness, he is faithful where we fall apart. Where we can't stand, he will stand. As it says in Hebrews chapter 4, he was tempted in every way as we were, yet without sin. This is the high priest that we can approach the throne of grace with. That's our invitation today. In the middle of your wilderness, in the middle of your test, don't give up. Contend for fruit that remains. Stay faithful for fruit that remains because he is faithful and you're not alone. Would you welcome Natalie and Carrie as they share their story this morning? We've been together for 16 years. 
married almost 14, and in those years, we've been through numerous struggles from loss of jobs, injuries, and hospitalizations to struggles with our oldest child. But the biggest struggle we have ever gone through is a struggle for control with God. Out of the 14 years we've been married, 13 of those as Christ followers, only four of those years have not been plagued with financial struggle. In 2012, I took a job that I thought was going to be life-changing, leading us to financial freedom. Making a six-figure salary was a dream come true. Night work lasting 70 hours plus. A week um, sacrifice. It was a sacrifice I was willing to make. As the years went on, I was not seeing the freedom that I wanted to see. We were still living paycheck to paycheck, often not tithing in fear that we wouldn't have money to pay our bills. In this time, I was really struggling with trusting God's word. I would pray Joshua 9 or Joshua 1 9 over myself at night in hoping for breakthrough. It says, I have not or have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Little did I know all I had to do was open my hands and let go. While Carrie was working long nights, God was doing work in me. I could see the struggle my husband was going through and would try to strong arm him into tithing, saying, don't worry about the money. God's going to take care of us. This backfired as his fear and need to provide were stronger than his belief. With our family falling apart due to lack of time together and Carrie's health deteriorating, I knew something needed to change. With lack of sleep, the financial struggle, a family in unrest, my nerves were shot and I was taking it out on everyone around me. The enemy was using my weakness and I knew I needed to take back what I had given and stop believing the lies. This began our journey of allowing God to truly provide. After much prayer and discussion, Carrie took a job as a refuse truck driver, a garbage man, making 65% less than his truck driving job. We knew a lot of things would have to change in order to make it work. Letting go of everything that wasn't essential, including an expensive car payment, was our first step. Trusting that God would make our money stretch, we utilized the food pantry on Thursdays and said no to all extras. Although I could see God being faithful, I was still struggling to fully submit financially. As I was waiting for a permanent position to open up for me as a garbage man, I re-injured my shoulder, causing me to live in a constant state of pain. I was questioning my choices as I fought depression silently, regretting my job change. I'd gained a lot of time that I spent with my family, which was amazing. Our home life was stable. My relationship with my wife was better than ever, ever. But we were still living paycheck to paycheck, not knowing where all the money was going to be for, for where it was coming from for our bills. And I still feared not being able to provide for my family. Eleven months after Carrie started his new job, I got a phone call from him in the middle of the day. He called to tell me he had been let go and no longer had a job. In the past, I would have freaked out. I would have gone into panic attacks and just like figure it out mode. But that's because I crave stability. <laughs> and for the last 11 months since he lost his or since he took this job, I had already been kind of just holding on barely. Um, I braced myself for the onslaught of emotions, but what came over me was God's peace. I knew things were about to get much, much harder, but I also knew in my spirit that things were also about to get really good. This is where it went. <laughs> we went from six figures to 65% less, bringing in to $1,000 a month in less than a year, or within a year. As I stood in the kitchen holding my wife, I heard God say, it's time to let go. At that point, I knew that I needed to fully give myself financially and all to him. We had nothing but God's promise to, to, prov to provide. 
Matthew 7, 24, 25, which states, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on a rock. The rain came down, the storms rose, the wind blew and beat against the house, yet it did not fail because of his foundation on the rock. I knew in my head what we needed to do all along, but it was... (laughs) I knew what we needed to do all along. Oh, man. So I couldn't ignore it anymore. I made the commitment from that port, part, point excuse me, to give my first fruits financially and otherwise to God who is faithful to us. And this is where it got a little crazy. Our mortgage company reduced our mortgage by two-thirds through a forbearance program. So we went from $1,200 a month to $400. We were given a car after ours died. Random bags of groceries, cash, gift cards were all left anonymously on our front porches. (laughs) Our children's extracurriculars were sponsored, and bills were paid, all without us asking. God took care of it all. We tithed, we gave freely, and we still had money in the bank. (laughs) $1,000 a month, that's all we were making. And it was miraculous. I've never felt more loved or seen, and all of our gods, all of our needs were taken care of by God and the generosity of our community. But God doesn't just care about our needs, he relishes in being able to fulfill our wants as well. So, yep. So, right before I had um, been let go from my job, we were planning our anniversary trip to Disneyland. So, the hotel was already paid for. We were planning on using my paycheck right before we were going to buy our tickets to Disneyland. And, obviously, that didn't happen because (laughs) three weeks before we were supposed to go, I was let go. So... Uh, after much urging from our family and friends, everybody just was like, you need to go anyways, make it a beach trip, get away, reestablish. So we're like, okay, all right, we'll go. As we get to the hotel, we walk in, it's full of Disney decor everywhere. So we're like smacked in the face. Checking into the counter, the lady is amazing. She's like, oh, will you be staying at, you know, as your stay here, are you guys going to go to Disneyland? We're like, yeah, no. So we told her a brief version of our story of what happened, that we were just going to make it a beach trip, see some sights, and she assured us we'd have fun anyways. About two hours later, we're getting ready to go to dinner. We're leaving the hotel, and I receive a call from the hotel. And the lady on the phone says, it's the manager. She said that there's a problem with our reservation. Can you please come back to the front desk? Here we are freaking out after everything that, you know, has been stripped from us. We're like, okay, well, you ready to make the long drive home? <laughs> we walk in to the um, lobby, and there is a bunch of staff members holding balloons, and they hand us a card with two Disneyland tickets in it. So God does get your wants. <laughs> Our trip was magical, obviously, and the whole way through the park, I just kept saying, I can't believe we're here. It was just like the biggest blessing to be able to celebrate God's goodness with my husband in our favorite place. The past several months have been, uh, we have been faithful in doing what God has asked us to do. We have Proverbs 2820 hanging in our kitchen as a reminder of the journey we have been through. And it says, a faithful man will abound with blessings, but he who hurries to be rich will not go unpunished. Going from having so much with nothing to show for it to having nothing but God's love, grace, and provision has proven that all you really need is just that, God. We know there will always be trials, and there will always be hard times, but where are we putting our trust? We know what works and what doesn't, and I pray that we always be intentional with allowing God to do work in our lives and not the other way around. Thank you. So... Doing it my way in the beginning, making six figures, obviously was not the plan. Um, Now, after everything has crashed down and God has slapped me and woke me up into walking his path, 
Uh, recently, I was offered a job with the potential to make six figures again, and I know that we will get there again. So I could see it. It's his way this time, not mine. So thank you all for letting us share, you guys. Let's stand together. We're going to pray. Let's invite down. Let's just stay standing. Let's invite the prayer team down. We're just going to have a minute here to pray so the prayer team can come forward. Father, we just thank you for this amazing morning. As we know, many of us are in the middle of this test, the test of provision. Well, we trust you. No matter what our economic status is, there's always a test. There's always an opportunity. There's always a furthering of your kingdom that you want us to be a part of. God, we know it would be easier for you to do kingdom work without us. Yet, you invite us into it. Lord, we thank you that we're your children, that you love us. God, right now, we just open up our hearts to say, what are you speaking? Right now, if you're in that place where you're in the test of provision, you're saying and hearing that invitation for God inviting you to trust him. Just raise your hand right now if that's you. Father, we just believe that we can trust. We will trust. We will trust. We will hold firm. We will stand faithful. God, we pray for those that are in the middle of temptation, that right now they would not surrender to that sin of appetite. Lord, they would be fed off the word of God, off your words that come from your mouth and straight to their hearts. Speak to them now. Father, I just ask that you just soften everybody's hearts today in this room, Lord, that needs you, God. I ask that you help humble them, Lord, to come forward, God, to step out of the darkness and into the light of you, God. Lord, give everybody the encouragement to stand strong in you, Lord, and say yes to you today, God, like I did. Stop living in fear. God is here and God is waiting for you. God loves you. Thank you. Lord, we just thank you so much for um, gently guiding us, sometimes not so gently, but um, that you're always there for us, even as we're trying to work it out ourselves, that you never strong arm us like we try to strong arm, strong arm each other, but that you just are there and you're waiting for us to get it. And so I just pray today that as people are walking through whatever it is that they're struggling with, whatever wilderness they're walking through, that they would just really understand what surrender means. And that they would just say, Lord, I give it to you. What I've been carrying on my shoulders, I now take off of my shoulders and lay at your feet. And that the Lord would just fill you with his presence and his peace and, his, and just the understanding that you are not alone. You are never alone. We thank you, God, for your love and your provision. In Jesus' name.